Hello everyone, it's David from Automotive Press. Guess what? I have two of the most interesting SUV or crossovers within the Toyota lineup. 2024 Toyota Land Cruiser, which is the one I own. This is the first edition. But this week I also have the Toyota Grand Highlander, perhaps the most important three-row crossover or SUV for Toyota because it's big and roomy and practical and it's all new for 2024. So how do you decide between two models that are similar in price but very different in approach and very different in design. Well, let me tell you 10 key differences between the Land Cruiser and the Grand Highlander so you can decide which one is the right one for you. Let's go. Welcome back. So let me tell you 10 key differences between the Land Cruiser and the Grand Highlander, which I know are two different models, but many people ask me if they should buy something like Land Cruiser versus something like a Grand Highlander because it's within the same price range and they're both, of course, top of the line Toyota models. Although there's a Sequoia above this one and there's a Highlander below this one. But anyhow, it'll be kind of interesting to tell you those 10 key differences so you can decide for yourself which one is the right model for you. The first one is obvious and that is the fact that Land Cruiser is full body on the frame design, which means the body and the frame are two separate designs and two separate manufactured items. You've got the full body that goes on top of the ladder frame, which houses the engine, the transmission, suspension, and all the key chassis components versus unitized body Grand Highlander, which is how 99% of crossovers are designed, where the body and the chassis underneath is all integrated, one unitized or monocoque design. So you don't have a separate frame underneath, although there is something that kind of mimics frame underneath the engine here. So that's the first difference. What does that actually mean? Well, this one is truly designed for off-roading, which I'll talk about a little bit more. It's more rugged. It sets quite a bit higher than unitized SUVs. Because there's a separate frame, it's also much stronger when it comes to those tough uh, terrains and really rugged roads. Whereas you could take the Grand Highlander to a light off-roading, but you wouldn't take this onto a true off-roading courses because it's going to damage the actual body. So this is unitized body, better for kind of overall smoother ride, more practical, has more space because there's no frame to intrude into the interior space. But body on frame is legendary for off-roading, but not as practical because it sets up higher. It takes up a lot more space in terms of actual interior packaging, so it's not as roomy. And there's some limitation when it comes to body on frame designs. So that is the most important difference. Off-road capable body on frame versus smoother, more practical, unitized body. Second key difference is the fact that this is built in Japan versus Grand Highlander, which is built in the US. To be specific, this is built in two different factories. You can tell by the VIN code. This one tells you it's K, which stands for the Hamura plant, which is part of a Hino factory in Japan. But it is built in Japan versus the Grand Highlander, which is built in the US at their Indiana plant, which is in Princeton. And you can tell that again by looking at the letter S, which stands for the Indiana plant. This is built in the US, built in Japan. The quality check I did earlier, it's actually quite good on both of them, but there's no question that this particular Land Cruiser does have a really good paint job and a very good body alignment and actually pretty good on the Grand Highlander as well, but the gap's a little bit wider and the paint job not quite as deep in terms of gloss compared to this one here. But it's not always to do with Japan versus US. Sometimes it's also to do with the factory the Hamura plant is well known for building a really good body and really good paint. And for Indiana plant, it is the first time they're building the Grand Highlander along with its cousin model, the Lexus TX. So they're going to probably still have some teething issues. But one advantage of the Grand Highlander is that it's built in the same line as a Lexus TX. So the standard that they use for Lexus TX is carried over the Grand Highlander. And therefore I noticed that the overall quality of the body and the paint is much better on this one than the regular Highlanders. That's something to think about. The third reason is a pretty obvious one, which I talked about earlier. This is a true off-roader designed to go anywhere. And they often say the Land Cruiser name is associated with taking people into the wild and bringing them back safely. And that is very apparent, not just from the body on, on frame design, but this one also has a center differential and also a rear locking differential as well. So you can lock out some of the wheels and he has a um, stabilizer bar that can be disengaged so that the wheels can articulate up and down much more. And that's a manual disconnect. And when you do that, this wheel and that wheel are no longer connected by the stabilizer bars. So these two wheels can move independently of each other, allowing this to go through some really difficult terrains, climb over rocks 
and going into the water and so forth, it is truly a very capable model that you can confidently take over any kind of terrain and you would dare not do that with the Grand Highlander which is a unitized body crossover with some capability for light off-roading like a gravel road and maybe some light terrains but you definitely cannot take this into some of the difficult uh, terrain uh, and rugged road that you would have no problem with the Land Cruiser. So there's substantial difference. Also this one has things like a crawl control which is like a cruise control for off-roading as well as multi-terrain select and also different angles for the camera that allow you to even see underneath the bumper here so you can see where exactly where you're going when you're going off-roading and they did many things uh, to make this one easier to off-road even the actual uh, rear view mirror is square and a little bit longer this way so you can see the bottom better and my first edition has a rock slider so if you actually go over the big terrain and you big rock hits over here it doesn't uh, damage the body so many many things that are designed specifically to allow for off-roading uh, that is not the case with this one but of course this is a smoother more practical choice the fourth reason is the fact that grand highlander comes in one two and three row and the third row is a true seating area where you can sit comfortably even if you're adult it's not a baby size one and so i can sit there for example it's quite comfortable but the land cruiser only comes in two rows at least for north american market in asia and elsewhere that, that land cruiser does have a third row option because they don't have hybrid system yet for those models it comes in diesel or gasoline and therefore the battery doesn't take up a space so you can actually get a third row in the land cruiser but here in north america you don't get the third row there so if you want to carry more than four or five passengers you have to get the Grand Highlander and of course this was designed to give you that full capacity and give you a very comfortable space in the third row. And very much related to the fourth reason is the fact that this is also much roomier and that's my fifth reason. It's a much bigger vehicle, it's longer, wider, also longer wheelbase as well and you can tell how much space I have here even in the second row but also lots of space in the third row and the first row of course is very comfortable. Headroom is plenty, shoulder room is really good. This one has two captain seat, but there are a number of different configurations. Either way is quite a bit roomier than the Land Cruiser, which is actually comfortable, but there's no way you can get this amount of legroom in the Land Cruiser as I will show you in a second. So now I hopped into the Land Cruiser and I've got the seat in the front set up pretty well the same on the Grand Highlander. And you can tell it's comfortable and actually plenty of uh, headroom because it's tall but nowhere as comfortable and as roomy as a Grand Highlander. You want to maximize space, get that one, not the Land Cruiser. The sixth difference is the powertrain. In the Grand Highlander, we have a 2.4 turbo with or without hybrid, but on a Land Cruiser, hybrid is standard. That's the only way it comes, which is 2.4 turbo as well with a full hybrid system. Now the two hybrid system is similar, but a little bit different, but this is designed for the body on the frame, Land Cruisers whereas this is designed for the Grand Highlander and some other models uses a similar system as well. But the basic engine system is the same. They're both 2.4 turbo, one of the most important engine now in the Toyota lineup. But the power and torque delivery is different. And of course, the feel on the road is very different between these two. I obviously like the kind of truck feel of the Land Cruiser coming from this, whereas this one is designed to feel much like a car, smooth and quiet. Uh, but there is some difference in power and torque, which I will talk about now. As I mentioned, the power and torque is a little bit different between these two models. I got my data sheet right here. On the base Grand Highlander, you can get it with 2.4 turbo with no hybrid. That one has a 265 horsepower. But if you get the one with the hybrid system, it jumps all the way to 362 horsepower and 400 pound foot of torque versus the Land Cruiser, which is actually not too far off. Uh, it's a little bit less than the Grand Highlander with 326 horsepower but the torque is really high on the Land Cruiser with as much as 465 pound-foot torque. So there's 65 more pound-foot torque on this one than that one, which is why this one feels really strong when you step on the gas and it takes off with lots of power. Almost feels like a diesel engine, even sound like a diesel engine. Maybe it's intentional. Uh, it's got lots of sound coming out of the muffler as well. Uh, but this one, uh, while it is similar engine, it feels different on the road but it's got lots of power and torque as well. What else is there in terms of differences? Well, the price are similar, but obviously this is cheaper than a Land Cruiser. Here in Canada, it starts in the mid 50,000 to sort of upper $60,000 range, but Land Cruiser starts at low 70,000 and it goes all the way to 
$90,000 for the first edition, which is the one I have. So they overlap a little bit toward the upper end of Grand Highlander and the basic model of the Land Cruiser. But clearly, if you want the cheaper model or more affordable model, this is the one to get, even though it's not cheap anymore. So you do get a lot of value for money in terms of space, in terms of feature for the Grand Highlander. But for me, I don't mind paying more to get the Land Cruiser name. Now, despite some differences in power and torque, there's absolutely no question that the fuel efficiency is better on the Grand Highlander compared to Land Cruiser, because there's also a difference in terms of weight. Now, the Land Cruiser is much improved over the previous model in the US, where they had a 200 series Land Cruiser with a V8 engine. That one was definitely gas guzzler. This one is definitely improved, but it's not anywhere as good as the Grand Highlander. I'll put the number here in the screen in terms of mileage for the Grand Highlander with the hybrid system and Land Cruiser with the hybrid system as well. As you know, it's all depending on how you drive. If you take this thing off-road, the fuel economy will suffer even more. And on the highway, you get a better fuel efficiency in general. So if you do want to save some money in terms of gas, then again, unitized body cars like the Grand Highlander has an advantage over a heavier, more off-road oriented vehicle like the Land Cruiser. The tenth and the final difference is the subjective matter, which is what happens when you actually drive these two cars back to back. How do they feel different? Well, there's no question that when you drive the Land Cruiser, you sit nice and tall. You feel like it's very much an off-road capable vehicle and it has a really good accurate steering compared to Grand Highlander, which is smooth. Of course, it's refined, very comfortable for the passengers, but for the driver, there's almost no feeling whatsoever. The steering is light, very little feedback from the road, and you know what, it feels kind of like uh, driving a big American car, which is maybe this intention, because it is designed for Americans and Canadians who like these softer feels. So if you want a SUV or crossover that is super smooth, but has very little um, feedback from the road and light steering, you're going to love this one. But if you want a little bit more accurate steering, a little bit more of a truck feel, then of course Land Cruiser is the one to get. For me, there's no question which one I enjoy driving. Even though they both have 2.4 turbo with hybrid, this one is more fun to drive. It's truck-like. I can feel the road a little bit better. Uh, but if you want to be able to carve the uh, curvy road and give the maximum comfort for passenger, then the Grand Highlander is better than the Land Cruiser. So it's something that you have to figure out on your own. Just keep in mind that one is more expensive than the other one, but the resale value of the Land Cruiser should also be much better than the Grand Highlander. So the whole life cycle cost of owning these two cars over the next, let's say, five to 10 years uh, could balance out to be about the same because this one has a better resale value. So I hope you enjoyed this video about two very different vehicles that's sitting on top of the Toyota's lineup. They both are SUV slash crossover with a different feel, with a different uh, target audience. And most of all, they feel very different on the road. So only you can decide which one's the right one for you. Make sure you test drive both of them back to back but hopefully the 10 key differences I mentioned to you is helpful in deciding which one is the right one to get. If you enjoyed my video, please give me a thumbs up, make some comments, and if you haven't done so yet, would you kindly subscribe as well. Until next video, I'm signing off for now. Thank you so much.